So I found these two stories out of Voice for Men. They both were outrageous. They both pissed me off, but one was really bad. Let me tell you about the first one. Um, it's a story about some male uh, college students who were suing their, their colleges because they were prematurely kicked out for sexual assaults or charges that were proven unfounded or false, and but they were still expelled from their colleges. So dozens of these men are suing their colleges. Okay, bad enough that some incident may or may not have taken place of some kind of sexual nature, but the due process was not respected, so they're suing. Okay, bad enough. <laughs> this other story is about uh, a Jeremiah True, a student who was banned from a mandatory humanities class because he made students feel uncomfortable. This is at Reed College. So this story is going viral. He's got a petition um, up at change.org. Um, I'm going to read a bunch of it for you because just what happened is just unbelievable. I've been to college and supposedly colleges, college in my day anyway, was a place where you, you had a free exchange of ideas and if you had an opinion, you were certainly free, even encouraged to speak up and give and um, make make your opinion known. Um, but it doesn't seem to be that way now. Um, I'm just going to read some of this petition. Um, this is from Reed College. Uh, the student is Jeremiah True, and Reed College is in Oregon. Um, this is at change.org. I'll put the link in the low bar. There's a lot of reading here. I'm just going to uh, read um, important sections. Um, so he starts here, Jeremiah True of Reed College in Portland, Oregon. Dear Reed College, On Saturday, March 14th, I was contacted by my Humanities 110 professor, Pancho Savary. He panned me. He banned me from my mandatory Humanities 110 class on the grounds that I made students in the conference extremely uncomfortable when I questioned, questioned the largely purported one in five rape statistic. I stated that I did not believe that the rape culture exists. He wrote me that morning saying, Sorry for not getting back to you sooner, but I was waiting until I had a conversation with Michael Falletra. The conference spent the entire class hour yesterday discussing the current situation and several things became clear. There are several survivors of sexual assault in our conference and you have made them extremely uncomfortable with what they see as not only your undermining incidents of rape, but of also placing too much emphasis on men being unfairly charged with rape. They and others do not feel comfortable being in the same classroom with you, not only because of this topic, but because of other things you have said to people personally or on Facebook in which you seem to undermine women's abilities in general. Didn't know that was illegal. The entire conference, without exception, men as well as women, feel that your presence makes them uncomfortable enough that they would rather not be there if you are there. And they have said that Things you have said in our conference have made them so upset that they have difficulty concentrating in other classes. I, have, as conference leader, have to do leader have to do what is best for the well-being of the entire class, and I am therefore banning you from conference course for the. I am banning you from conference for the remainder of the semester. Transferring to another conference at this late point in the semester is not an option. You can still get credit for the course by completing the last paper in the final exam. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Jeremiah goes on. The day before Professor Savary sent me this email, I sent him one explaining my views on rape culture. And here it is. Hi, Pancho. First, allow me to say that I don't believe that I'm sexist, but even if I am, that doesn't mean I'm wrong about rape, rape culture. Much as Aristotle made the mistake of believing that some people were born to be slaves, yet crafted much of ancient philosophy, 
I think it is possible for a person to hold incorrect views and still have a valid argument. I don't care what I'm labeled as being as long as truth has its day. I was raised by a single mother and my two sisters and was always taught about how powerful and passionate women could be by their examples. I do not believe I am a sexist, but I do place reason above emotion. I just wanted to point you towards my sources for my argument on Wednesday, and there are many sources beyond these. You say that all arguments must have textual evidence. This is my textual evidence. It is not based on opinions. It is based on data and hard facts. You said to me that it's, impo it's impossible to be objective. I think when it comes to data and numbers, it must be possible to be objective. We do not serve actual rape victims by overinflating the numbers on rape. And then he cites three, three websites, um, uh, three articles at RAIN, R-A-I-N-N, the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, is the nation's largest anti-sexual violence organization. It was named one of America's 100 best charities by Worth Magazine. Okay, he lists those links. And here's a quote from Rain. In the last few years, there's been an unfortunate trend towards blaming rape culture for the extensive problem of sexual violence on campuses. While it, while it is helpful to point out the systemic barriers to addressing the problem, it is important to not lose sight of a simple fact. Rape is caused not by cultural factors, but by the conscious decisions of a small percentage of the community to commit a violent crime. Jeremiah continues, the argument that our culture propagates and per permits rape is simply unfounded. The total population of the U.S. has grown consistently over the past century, yet as our population and thus our culture has grown, rates of rape have fallen. We don't live in a rape culture, which propagates the rape of women. He then goes on to cite legal precedents. In the case of Tinker versus Des Moines Independent Community School District, 1969, the court decided as follows. The school did not violate the student's rights Non-disruptive, passive, symbolic speech cannot be censored just because it makes others uncomfortable. The symbolic wearing of armbands could not be shown to interfere with school discipline. The Supreme Court established the Tinker Test, the standard that public schools must meet before legally restricting free speech or expression of students. The free expression of public stool, school students can only be restrict, restricted if it threatens a material and substantial disruption of the educational process or invades the rights of others. I love this. In the United States versus Stevens case of 2010, the court decided the Westboro, Westboro Baptist Church could not be hurt, prohibited directly or punished indirectly through a lawsuit seeking legal damages. I have not done anything nearly so heinous or offensive as picketing a soldier's funeral. I question the validity of a statistic in class. I cause members of my class to feel uncomfortable. I did not threaten or intimidate anyone within this class. I apologize that I caused survivors of sexual assault to feel uncomfortable with my views. But the views were in no way threatening or hostile. I did not use any obscenities in class. I did not declare any fighting words. I did not commit perjury. I did not blackmail anyone in the class. I did not engage in incitement to imminent lawless action. I did not engage in true threats and I did not engage in solicitations to commit crimes. The college has infringed upon several of its own rules. From the faculty handbook, Academic Freedom and Responsibility, Section 1. Each faculty member has individual freedom of inquiry and expression in research, in publication, and in the teaching of his or her subjects and courses. Academic freedom and responsibility are here, def here defined as the liberty and obligation to study, to investigate, and to discuss facts and ideas concerning all branches and fields of learning. No limitations on such freedom shall be imposed 
other than those required by generally accepted standards of responsibility, responsible scholarship and research. Also, from the faculty handbook, dissent. The faculty affirms that it has not changed its policy as expressed in the following statement. Reed College considers the right of free speech and therefore that of dissent to be fundamental to its life as an academic community. The exercise of the right of dissent is not something I can't help but smile when reading this. I continue. The exercise of the right of dissent is not something to be grudgingly tolerated, but actively encouraged. The boundaries of dissent stop at the point where the exercising of it and the decisions accompanying the exercise are denied to others. Accordingly, protests or demonstrations shall not be discouraged so long as neither force nor the threat of force is used, and so long as the orderly processes of the college are not deliberately obstructed. Physical obstruction, the threat and use of force in the interest of dissent, are things which cannot be tolerated in the academic community, and those engaging in it must be regarded as having violated conditions fundamental to the preservation of its integrity and of its very life. Also, from the faculty handbook, the honor principle. The preamble to the current community constitution applies to all students faculty members, and staff members. It states, we declare our commitment to responsible and honorable conduct in academic and community affairs, and we reaffirm one another's rights to freedom of inquiry and expression in coursework, scholarship, and the day-to-day -day life of the Reed community. Since such freedom requires an atmosphere of trust and mutual confidence, we further declare that dishonesty, intimidation, harassment, exploitation, and the use or threat of force are incompatible with the preservation of this freedom. Man, it doesn't seem like these, uh, this college has a leg to stand on at all with these supposed principles that they have. Um, I am going to continue this. Um, but I wonder if some of this material will all of a sudden uh, disappear. I continue. Appendix. The Statement on Professional Ethics. Professors, guided by a deep conviction of the worth and dignity of the advancement of knowledge, recognize the special responsibilities placed upon them. Their primary responsibility to their subject is to seek and to state the truth as they see it. To this end, professors devote their energies to developing and improving their scholarly competence. They accept the obligation to exercise critical self-discipline. We're talking about prof professors here. They accept the obligation to exercise critical self-discipline and judgment in using, extending, and transmitting knowledge. They practice intellectual honesty. Although professors may follow subsidiary interests, those interests must never seriously hamper or compromise their freedom of inquiry. As teachers, professors encourage the free pursuit of learning in their students. They hold before them the best scholarly and ethical standards of their discipline. Professors demonstrate respect for students as individuals and adhere to their proper roles as intellectual guides and counselors. Not muzzle. Professors make every reasonable effort to foster honest academic conduct and to ensure that their evalua evaluations of students reflect each student's true merit. They avoid any exploitation, harassment, or discriminatory treatment of students. Wow! They acknowledge significant academic or scholarly assistance from them. They protect their academic freedom. Wow! So, it's your role, professors, to protect students' academic freedom. It doesn't seem like Jeremiah True's freedom was protected. 
I'm going to con continue here. As citizens engaged in a profession that depends upon freedom for its health and integrity, professors have a particular obligation to promote conditions of free inquiry and to further public understanding of academic freedom. You know, I think um, these professors should reread their mottos and something that they took a commitment to when they took these jobs. Um, I think the administration should also uh, look this over because I think Jeremiah Chu has an enormous case against the school. I can't believe what they did to him. Um, I am going to continue here. He's done an amazing job with this petition. I'm going to continue reading it and continue on, uh, comment on later. He says, I have been told that the process necessary to potentially restore me to my class will take five weeks. I will miss out on a wonderful education in those five weeks. I cannot wait that long. I am concerned for my education. I, he's, I hope he sues the balls off these people. But I am more concerned that there is a mentality on college campuses that this activity is permissible and that my country's sacred rights to freedom of speech is being ignored. I am a freedom feminist and I believe in Dr. Christina Hoff Summers' message. I believe Karen Strawn. I believe Janice Fiamengo. I believe that it is on me to stand up for myself and I will go to the utmost limits of my ability to do it. I am concerned that I cannot openly question deeply held beliefs. I do not know if this is the right way to bring attention to it. I have resigned my position on my school's student-run government because of my conviction that this movement has damaged my society and must be stopped. We agree. I do not care about legality. I do not care about my place at Reed, should it come to that. I do not know if this is legal action. Something must be done. Will you please help me? I am ready to follow this through all the way. I don't care what happens to me. I just want everyone to have their rights respected. I pray I have convinced you of the gravity of this situation. You have. This is unbelievable. That's happening in colleges in the United States of America? Wow! I have resigned my post from student government due, the, due to the risk of breaking our neutrality clause. I have resigned from my school's faculty theater production as I do not want to risk tarnishing the hard work of my director and colleagues with my status as an on-campus political dissident. I am a freedom feminist this is not a good place to be. I sent this letter to the entirety of the faculty this morning. I am prepared to take this as far as I need to go. Well, good for you, Jeremiah. Just like we're going to do. We'll be with you. I may be a radical, but I prefer to think that I am radical in the way that Martin believed Jesus was a radical for love. I believe so strongly in equality that I will put my entire life on the line to stop something that I'm convinced endangers that equality. Here, here. No matter what happens, I love you, Mom. I love you, Dad. I love you, my dear, dear sisters. I love you, my dearest friends. I love you all. And I will sacrifice everything for you. I am so sorry that I've kept you at a distance while this has happened. I want to keep you safe. I need to keep you safe. I do not know where my life will go from here. I do not think I will make it out of this unscathed. And I'm sitting here writing this, sobbing uncontrollably. In spite of all the pain that we have experienced, my family still tries to show they care, however possible. possible. I have hurt them in this time of crisis, and that weighs upon me. I know that, despite our distance and our differences, I love my family and they love me. I do not want to be a martyr, but I will do that if that is what is necessary to make a statement. I hope you are willing to stand with me. Jeremiah, Jeremiah Josias Luther George True. I am sorry for how poorly written this is. I am sorry for how emotional this is. I do not know how to begin a movement. I do not know what is needed. I simply do not know enough, of, enough about the world to do this yet. But that is precisely why I came to read. 
please do everything in your ability to spread this petition. This action is horrible, and I will happily take an expulsion or jail time to stop it. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Martin Luther King Jr., letter from a Birmingham jail. This was a letter to Reed College. So this petition, I'm, I'm going to put the, uh, the link on the low bar. This is at change.org. Um, just unbelievable. Um, we, we stand for you all the way, Jeremiah. Um, this is injustice. Unbelievable. You were just gi giving your opinion in a college classroom. You know, when I went to college, I took a couple of women's studies classes because I wanted to see what bullshit they were, what they were, they were telling. And, of course, it was bullshit, you know, and I spoke my mind, and some people were a little shocked at uh, the things that I was saying, but <laughs> this is America, freedom of speech. I can say exactly what I want, okay? Um, but it, it seems like that some colleges uh, do not even adhere to the Constitution. Um, they don't even seem to adhere to their own um, uh, motto. And, um, but Jeremiah here has pointed that out. And he's, he's creating a big stink. And uh, I hope he sues the pants off of this college. Uh, he's got this petition going. So isn't that too bad that some people got uncomfortable by some ideas in a classroom? Uh, well, that's too fucking bad. Are you kidding me? Are you that weak and feeble-minded that you can't take hearing some challenging, challenging ideas and you get uncomfortable? Uncomfortable? I don't give a shit about being uncomfortable. There's no right to it, to people's comfort. You don't have the absolute right. There's no guarantee to your comfort. No one has that right. And, and you expect to kick someone out of a class because you feel uncomfortable? That's too fucking bad. You have got to be kidding me. <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, that's what this Constitution guarantees us that you're allowed to be stupid, you're allowed to be offensive, or stupid, or bigoted. That's not illegal. Not illegal. I could call you names, and the cops can't come and arrest me. I could say feminism is bullshit, I could say you're bullshit, and no one's going to arrest me. I could say whatever I feel, and you could feel uncomfortable. Too bad. So now it's going to be uh, illegal to be disagreeable? Is that what your college stands for? Reed College up there in Oregon? Oregon? You cannot be disagreeable. You can have all these highfalutin mottos and um, convictions that um, truth, truth is <laughs> important above all else and, and free inquiry. But you're lying. You're lying. You can't agree, disagree. You can't disagree with the dogmatic, uh, uh, dogmatic principle of feminism. No, you can't. Nope. And there is no free inquiry in, in your college. I tell you what I think I would have done. I would have. I, I hope I would have had the guts to ignore an email that told me I can't go to my class, and I would have went to that class. I would have made them forcibly eject me. And then I would have sued. And you know what? A, a firestorm of publicity that would have been. I would have loved it. Are you kidding me? You're ejecting me from my own class for what? For disagreement? <sighs> wow. I, uh, as I said, I, I attended some uh, women's women's studies classrooms, and uh, I took a uh, class called Women and the Law. And yes, I spoke up, and me knowing more than most of these youngsters, um, I challenged the idea that um, somebody was saying that uh, rape um, was allowed to go on in the past, and, you know, there really weren't any restrictions about it. I said, that's absolutely not true. Are you kidding me? They used to lynch people, men, for rape. <laughs> and, of course, the law professor had to say, of course it's true. Rape, rape... Rape has never been allowed or promoted or looked the other way. It's always been a heinous crime, <laughs> punishable by death in some cases. And the law 
professor agreed, told the, the class the truth. So please go sign this petition and um, let, let's uh, support this man, Jeremiah True, and stop the bullshit that's going on in this country. Okay, bye-bye.